So we need some example. Uh, the borosilicate glass or BK7 glass. This is a very uh, popular uh, media uh, used in fabricating optics like lens or mirrors or web plates and so on. Okay. Here we assume the input pulse duration is 10 femtoseconds. And if the input pulse is transform limited Gaussian pulse, you can quickly calculate the corresponding bandwidth, right? Because the time bandwidth product is a constant, 0 0.441. So if you substitute 10 femtoseconds in the denominator, you got 44 terahertz, okay? 10 femtosecond pulse, 44 terahertz bandwidth in theory. And if we assume this laser pulse is centered at 800 nanometer, say from a tisulfide laser, and then we uh, send the pulse passes through a BK7 glass, and uh, you can calculate the beta 2 curve, the GVD parameter, as a function of wavelength. Here I assume the wavelength. Uh, changing from 600 nanometers to 1700 nanometers. This, this happens to be the, uh, the range of typical optical spectrum analyzer, OSA. Your的光谱分析很常见,可以看到的范围就是 uh, sorry, here. I use this formula, okay? Uh, I need to find the uh, Selmar equation for BK7 glass. I, I can numerically calculate the second order derivative of index. Then using equation one, I can calculate beta two as a function of wavelengths, okay? So this is the result. And uh, since the working wavelength is centered at 800 nanometers, so look at 800 nanometers, you can find the corresponding beta 2 is 44.6 uh, in units of femtosecond square per millimeter. Okay. Then if we assume the thickness of the BK7 glass is 1 centimeter, okay? Then you can use the formula in the previous page. The output pulse width is about beta 2 times L times bandwidth in terms of angular frequency. So this is 2 pi constant times bandwidth in terms of non-angular frequency, delta nu, 44 terahertz. Okay, so beta 2 is here, big L is 1 centimeter, Delta nu is 44 terahertz, so multiply them together, you got 124 femtosecond. Okay, so 10 femtoseconds in, 124 femtosecond out, stretched by a factor of more than 12. So you can easily sense how serious the dispersion could be, right? Just one centimeter thick glass. Okay, it's transparent, no absorption. <laughs> and the uh, induced dispersion is so huge, it can stretch your input pulse by 12 times. Okay. Let me ask you, what happens if the thickness is reduced to just one millimeter? What is the output pulse width? So I heard 12.4 femtosecond, okay? If I further reduce the thickness to 0.1 millimeter, what is the output pulse width? Correct. <laughs> if you still use this 
formula, you will get 1.24 femtosecond. It's post compression. <laughs> 10 femtosecond in, 1.2 femtosecond out. Wow, what, what's, uh, uh, what a wonderful word. Without doing anything, just use 0.1 millimeter thick glass, you got a post compression of a factor maybe 7 or 8. It's impossible. In that case, this formula is no longer useful. Why? Bandwidth is broaden. Uh, in the case of dispersion, the power spectrum remains. No change about your power spectrum. So you will have no new frequency components. You will also sacrifice no frequency components. Okay, everything is the same in terms of power spectrum. So why this formula does not work if the thickness L is <coughs> too short. Great. Uh, you have you have deep understanding about the derivation of this formula. Although this picture is quite easy, but be careful. <laughs> it only applies when your output pulse is much broader than your input pulse. This picture works. Otherwise, it's a matter of redistribution of your different frequency components within your envelope, input pulse envelope. The output pulse duration will not be uh, can never be shorter than the input, right? If your input pulse is already transform limited, there is no way you can even compress it without creating new frequency components. Okay, so be careful. This picture only applies when the expected pulse duration is already significantly broader than the input pulse width. So. In our example, this is okay. Input just 10, output 124. So the formula should be accurate. But if it's only 12.4, it's controversial <laughs> on the verge of uh, failure. If it is 1.24, no way. <laughs> it's, it's impossible. Okay. Good. Then, Material dispersion properties. Uh, we might have discussed this before. Uh, by the model of harmonic oscillator, you can derive your absorption spectrum should be like the blue dashed curve. Your index spectrum uh, should be like the red solid curve. Okay, so you can see around the absorption peak your index of refraction actually decreases with frequency. But on the uh, spectral wings, your index of refraction increases with frequency. Okay, so this is the typical phenomenon you can observe. Then, if we draw the index of refraction uh, against not angular frequency but wavelengths, what do you have? You should get something uh, mirroring of the red curve, right? Because higher frequency means shorter wavelengths. So you should get something like this. For each absorption, like UV absorption, you get a, a characteristic curve like the mirroring of this one. For another absorption, like infrared absorption, you got another characteristic curve, and they can be concatenated with each other. So you got the index of refraction spectrum. And I use two background colors to identify two different regions. Say, around the gray shaded area, this area, you have a positive slope, right? And uh, it's 
uh, it refers to anomalous dispersion, just like here, around the absorption peak, your index of refraction appears anomalously or unusually, because typically you are working with transparent regions. So here you got a very different characteristics, anomalous dispersion, characterized by positive slope of uh, index of refraction spectrum. Conversely, in the yellow tone region, you have negative slope. You can see the index decreases with wavelengths. This is the normal dispersion area. Okay? If you use the slope of index as the definition of anomalous or normal dispersion, this is the way we can categorize it. Okay. The gray area, anomalous dispersion. Yellow area, normal dispersion. And then this is used in classical optics. Because like this picture, this is a prism, right? If you shine a white light, like sunlight, through the prism, you got a rainbow outside, right? And the order of colors of this rainbow depends on the dispersion sign of this prism. Usually this is normal dispersion, so you will have a red color first and the blue color last. If you got the reverse, it means you are using a material of anomalous dispersion. Okay, and then this, this is a very historical phenomenon. So classical optics uses this definition. The sign of first order derivative to define normal or anomalous dispersion. But the same curve can be divided differently if we use a different definition. Okay? For example, here, gray area, the second order derivative is negative. So it means uh, a convex function. Okay? This is still around the absorption peak, so this is anomalous dispersion still. But you can see, in addition to the area around the absorption peak, there is another region with negative curvature, okay, or a convex function. So both the gray area and the cyan area represent anomalous dispersion. If you use second-order derivative, as the definition of normal or anomalous dispersion. Okay? And uh, similarly, the yellow area, you have a positive curvature or a concave function. They represent normal dispersion. Okay? And this definition is used in the community of ultrafast optics. And the reason is, it is the second order derivative instead of first order derivative, defining the sign of chirp, up chirp or down chirp. It depends on second order derivative, just as what we just derived, right? The beta 2 coefficient is proportional to n double prime instead of n prime. So it's up chirp or down chirp depends on second order derivative or curvature of the index curve. So different definitions, different results. Okay, any question? Traditional Guang Xue, he doesn't have a short term mic drop, he doesn't have a chirp. What he is concerned about is the color of the sun coming out of the sky. The color of the sun. 那这件事用一阶微分可以决定，所以用一阶微分定义之下，你就会得到一个结果。只有在 absorption peak 附近是 anomalous dispersion， 一离开就是 normal dispersion， 很单纯。但是在 ultra fast optics 里面呢 ，chirp 是 up chirp 还是 down chirp 是我们关心的事情，而这个必须由二阶微分而不是一阶微分决定。你用二阶微分来当定义，你就会发现 anomalous 不只出现在 Absorption peak 附近
，在远离 peak 的中间也会有一个区域是 anomalous， 虽然它的折射率递减，按照第一种定义它是 normal dispersion， 但是按照第二种定义，因为凹口向下，它变成 anomalous dispersion， 这里可以产生 down t r i p l s 这里可以产生 down t r i p l s 啊，这里是啊 up t r i p l s Okay, another example: transmission and the dispersion of BK7 glass. So this is the absorption spectrum. Uh, sorry, transmission spectrum. I retrieved from the website of Saw Labs, uh, a company set in optics. Okay. So you can see uh, for a piece of BK7 glass of 10 millimeter thickness. The trans uh, transmission spectrum is pretty flat and high over this region. Okay, and you can see clear UV absorption here, about uh, 320 nanometers. Okay, another infrared absorption here around maybe uh, 2,800 nanometers. Within the uh, with between them, you got a flat transparent region. So, it means this glass can be used in the whole spectrum. It 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 can be used in the whole spectrum. 那但是有些人他必须操作在紫外光 （ultraviolet）。那么 BK7 maybe 就有点风险，因为它只到三百多纳米，它就会吸收啊。所以有一种叫做 UV grade 啊 ，silica 啊，就是还是 silica base， 但是有经过一些特别的处理 ，UV absorption can be down to 170 nanometers， so it's it's pretty 啊、uh,。Flexible. If you want to access UV optics, uh, you might need uh, UV grade silica instead of BK7. This is no longer a good choice. And I also conducted the numerical simulation for index of refraction as a function of wavelength. Again, from 600 nanometers to 1700 nanometers. You can see this curve. The red curve, a monotonically decreasing function of wavelengths. Okay, so in terms of classical optics, this is normal dispersion, right? Within the entire region, spectral region, this is uh, normal dispersive. But I also calculated beta two as a function of wavelengths. I got Positive beta two, zero beta two, then negative beta two. So you, if you check the zero beta two, it's thirteen twenty two nanometers. That means when wavelength is longer than thirteen twenty two nanometers, you got negative beta two or anomalous dispersion in terms of ultrafast optics definition. But in terms of class, classical optics definition. It is still normal dispersion. Okay. okay. Then second order dispersion or third order phase. Okay. Before we look at the formulas, do you still remember the impact of third order spectral phase? It's very different from the impact of second-order spectral phase. Basically, second-order spectral phase only broaden your pulse, and maybe it does not change your pulse shape too much. A Gaussian input, maybe it's still a Gaussian output, but only broader. But if you introduce third-order spectral phase, cubic phase, what will happen? It's no longer just pulse width uh, broadening. It's a matter of shape distortion, right? It becomes asymmetric function, and then maybe you will have oscillating uh, tail, right? 
So in what occasions third order spectral phase matters? Okay, two cases. First, the walking bandwidth is very large, such that this number is bigger than this number. The meaning of the first number is the phase accumulation, uh, the cubic phase accumulation, right? Uh, beta xi times omega cubic, but omega is a variable. You need to substitute some number for that variable. And the reasonable number is the bandwidth, right? So if you substitute delta big omega bandwidth into the variable omega, this is the total phase due to the cubic term. And this is the total phase due to the quadratic term. If this term is bigger than this term, of course, cubic phase matters. It's more important than the quadratic phase. Okay. A second case. If your spectral center is close to the zero dispersion wavelength, what is zero dispersion wavelength? It's the wavelength, a very special wavelength, where the corresponding beta 2 is zero. If you take BK7 as an example, this is 1322 nanometers, as I show you in last page. Okay. Either way, if case 1 or case 2 happens, cubic phase is important. So we need to uh, derive the formulas. This is the formula for beta xi, okay? uh, in terms of variable omega or in terms of variable lambda. Okay? I skip the intermediate steps. Uh, you can just follow the same strategy. And uh, in fiber optics, say you purchase a piece of fiber, you can check the spec. Usually you can find two parameters, two key parameters. One is uh, big D. What is big D? GVD parameter related to beta 2 about the quadratic spectral phase modulation, right? The other one is dispersion slope, big S, which is the derivative of big D. Okay. Uh, and if you substitute the formula of big D, performing another derivative with respect to lambda, you got this. Okay. Oh. So, many times, maybe this three phase is not so important. But especially at this time, this is unavoidable because the two phase is already zero. The first phase must be considered from the three phase perspective. 所以像是 fiber 呢 ，maybe 在一千三百纳米左右，那三阶的 phase 就非常明显。这时候你要考虑的就是 big S dispersion slope， 而不是 dispersion。Actually， this issue evolves with some、uh, history of fiber optics development、uh,。We know、uh,。Zero dispersion is around 1300 nanometers for long. Because if you use silica as the fiber material, zero dispersion wavelength is there. People know that a uh, long time ago. So a very natural idea is why not to uh, use laser sources at 1300 nanometers? Because that is zero dispersion uh, wavelength. So supposedly, if you use 1300 nanometers lasers and the fibers, you can transmit the signal for a very long distance without the requirement of recompression, right? Because no dispersion. So it's a very grand advantage, very attractive. OK. Uh, however, People later found that it's not a good choice. If you're working at 1300 nanometers, you will have zero beta 2, but in that case, cubic phase dominates. And it's more difficult to deal with cubic phase. Okay. So eventually, people switched to 1500 nanometers, 1550 nanometers. Although the dispersion is not zero, but the loss is minimal, okay? 
and uh, you will suffer basically uh, quadratic phase modulation. You need compression, but it's not too difficult. Okay. Any question? Okay, last page about this section. The need of a dispersion compensator. Uh, first, a Morlock laser can produce a chirp pulse. Do you still remember the materials in lesson four? When we talk about passive Morlock lasers, the output pulse could be chirped if your cavity has non-zero dispersion and uh, cell phase modulation, curl effect. Your output pulse could be chirped. So in that case, anyway, you need dispersion compensation, right? Secondly, even you can generate a transform limited pulse from your Molag laser, okay? It will get chirped by passing through optical elements. For any optical system, you need optical elements. And when your pulse passes through them, it got chirped. So you need you still need a dispersion compensator to compress it back to transform limit. And in theory, the chirping can be done by using a proper material of adequate thickness, right? In this lesson, we analyzed the formulas of material dispersion. So maybe if you have some chirp pulse, if you know the chirp, you can find some suitable material with adequate thickness, both. You can do dispersion compensation. But this seems not a very good idea, right? Uh, it's a case-by-case -case solution. Sometimes you can never find suitable material for your spatial chirp, right? OK, so that's the, uh, the issue I mentioned here. It's difficult to ach achieve a specific uh, complementary spectral phase function for perfect dechirping, okay, if you want to use material dispersion. And uh, another thing is material anomalous dispersion is accompanied with absorption, just like what we analyzed. So it's lossy in compensating upture pulses. You have upture pulse. If you want to compress it, you need anomalous dispersion. But if you try to access anomalous dispersion, it's risky. You will run into the absorption region. So although you might compress your pulse, but you will lose some power, which is uh, undesirable. Okay. So it, it means we need some other architecture to build up dispersion compensator instead of using material dispersion. Okay, okay let's take a rest of 10 minutes. <laughs>